Hey guys, welcome back. As I'm sure you all know, Halo New Blood released last week and, well, I only have two words. Fucking awesome review. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. But no, really, this book is amazing. The second book from 343's partnership with Gallery Books, Halo New Blood is a digital first novel by New York Times best-selling author and game designer Matt Forbeck. The story follows Buck and his squad, Alpha 9, during the end of the Human Covenant War while also giving insight into Buck's past. Prior to this book's release, Mr. Forbeck was interviewed by 343 writer Jeff Easterling and made note of his love of Halo in general and Halo 3 ODST in particular. And I have to say, it really shows. Forbeck did an amazing job at capturing Buck's speech patterns and mannerisms, so much so that I was reading this book in Buck's voice without any effort. It felt like a story given by Buck. If Nathan Fillion were ever tapped for an audio version of this book, I'd buy it in a heartbeat. But enough gushing, it's time to get into the summary. If you wish to avoid spoilers, click the annotation on the screen to skip to the spoiler-free wrap-up. If you're watching on mobile or tablet and can't see annotations, check the description box below for the time to skip too. So with that out of the way, let's talk Halo New Blood. The story starts in 2555, with Buck already being a Spartan. The story is framed as a debriefing following an incident on the colony of Talitza. Interesting thing here, Talitza is the setting for the multiplayer map Outcast, the map's base is meant to be insurrectionist strongholds. This moon was also the location where the Mjolnir Gen 2 Wetwork variant was tested, notably against the United Rebel Front. Keep this in mind as we go forward. Our story opens with a bit of dialogue from Buck, and this stuff is absolutely great. Buck notes how great the victory against the Covenant was, but also condones the hell yeah humanity attitude that's popped up ever since. Funny that I hadn't thought about this until now, but it's kind of like America's attitude following the end of World War II, an attitude that many Americans continue to express, but I'm getting off topic. We start with the briefing for the mission. Buck, Romeo, and Mickey, what remain of Alpha 9, and we'll get into the fates of Dutch and Rookie later, are all Spartans being sent to Talitza to recover Virgil, the Huragok recovered in Halo 3 ODST, and his human handler, Sadie Endesha. Yep, Sadie's back. Pausing a moment, there are a ton of Easter eggs and references throughout the book, such as Sadie herself. I'll try to cover most of them, but it's likely that I'll miss several. Believe me when I reiterate, there are tons. Anyway, Virgil and Sadie have been captured by the United Rebel Front, and Alpha 9 is tasked with recovering them. Like in ODST, Veronica Dare is working with them, but in a less direct manner this time, acting more as a mission handler. The relationship between her and Buck has improved vastly, and the two have as close to a real relationship as they can ever have. It's a nice compromise, as I don't think anyone ever believed that Buck or Dare would give up their military careers, but people still want to see them get together in the end. So while not married or any sort of formal relationship, they are together in a capacity that works for the characters. During the mission briefing, Dare brings up the fact that Oni and the UNSC have been using the United Rebel Front as a testing ground for Mjolnir Gen 2, which brings me back to the Wetwork variant. While the armor sets used by Alpha 9 are never identified, it's been theorized by many that Wetwork may have been used, by Buck at least, if not by all of Alpha 9. However, based on later events, I'm more inclined to think that they may have standard recruit armor or something similar. Anyway, Alpha 9 is deployed to Talitza, several clicks from their target, forcing them to hoof it. Along the way, the team talks, making it clear that none of them are comfortable fighting against humans. Like in ODST, Romeo and Mickey are pretty much open about their opinions, while Buck does what he can to keep their minds on the missions and keep his opinions to himself. While they are all veterans of the Covenant War, none of them were around to fight the insurrection, not even Buck who was born in 2510. Fighting fellow humans is a completely alien concept to them, and while Buck does what an NCO does to keep his troops in line, we can see how much it bothers him, too. It doesn't take long for the team to get close to the URF compound, and they quickly spot Virgil from atop a large hill. When Buck attempts to get up to move, he feels the back of his helmet hit something, and his team warns him not to move, just as a platoon of insurrectionists emerge from the rocks nearby, their rust-colored armor having disguised them. At this point, Buck veers off on a tangent. I'll be honest, I won't be able to make these flow as well as the book, so please don't let my inability to make a smooth segue fool you into thinking the author cannot. Anyway, we learn a bit about Buck's early life on Draco 3 and how it shaped him. He never really intended to join the military in those early days, content instead to fish with his family, going after large native creatures he called octo-whales. However, when Harvest was attacked, Buck felt he had no choice but to sign up. Sadly, as mentioned in his profile on Halo Waypoint, Buck was absent during the fall of Draco 3. But what's worse is what happened after. While the invasion of Draco 3 started like any other, its fate is pretty terrifying. After the opening assault, grunts and jackals were sent planetside for a less than standard invasion. 
they hunted down the survivors for sport, even eating some. Much of the planet was then spared from the glassing beams, left instead as a hunting ground for Covenant in their downtime. Interestingly, the invasion of Draco III is said to be the reason why Buck joined the ODSTs, which conflicts with his Waypoint article. The article stated that Buck had been accepted into the ODST training program in 2532 as a result of his service on Harvest. I can only hope this discrepancy will be fixed in the future. We then flash to 2554. Alpha 9, and I mean all of Alpha 9, is being tapped to go to Draco 3, which had become a hotbed of URF activity. This would mark the first time Buck had been back to Draco 3 since the planet had been glassed. On Draco 3, they track the URF to New Albany's Capitol building. Unfortunately, it's a trap. As soon as they breach the legislature, the exit is sealed. Buck sends the rookie for an emergency exit, hoping it would allow the ODST a chance to flank the URF forces. Sadly, the rookie is captured along the way, and the insurrectionist leader for the Draco 3 URF, Captain Ingridson, holds a gun to his head while demanding the rest of Alpha 9 disarm. While Buck tries to figure out his next move, he gets a call from someone neither I nor he expected. Spartan Sarah Palmer. We flash back again as we learn about the brief history Buck has had with Palmer. In 2546, Buck's team, the original Alpha 9, were sent to Lethbridge Industrial's plant on Sargasso. Fun fact, Spartan Daisy 023 was born on Sargasso. Alpha 9's mission was to recover some data extremely important to Oni. To give Alpha 9 the time it needed, another ODST squad, Gamma 6, Palmer squad, would be drawing the fire of the local Covenant forces. As would become a common trend, their Oni handler was none other than Veronica Dare. We flash back again! <laughs> to a year before at a resort called Castellaneta, which orbits Saturn's outermost ring. Short story, they meet, fuck like animals for a week, and then it all comes crashing down. Buck, as he's on his way out to continue active duty, wanted to continue pursuing a relationship with Dare, but Dare couldn't allow it. As we know, and Buck learns, she's Oni. From there, it's all downhill. Buck doesn't react well to this, and the two leave on less than ideal terms. Back on Sargasso, Alpha 9 moves as fast as they can to recover the data. The sooner they can succeed, the sooner Gamma 6 can be extracted. They meet resistance along the way, but nothing too difficult thanks to Gamma 6's distraction. On the way to their extraction zone, Buck decides to listen in on Gamma 6, only to discover that they are getting hit and hard. Going off mission, Buck decides to divert his course and help Gamma 6, much to Oni and Veronica's discontentment. Unfortunately, by the time Alpha 9 arrives, only Palmer is left. Though outnumbered and outgunned, Palmer and Alpha 9 are able to fight off the local Covenant forces and make their way to an extraction zone. The whole sequence is beautifully written. Of course, it's awesome and pretty interesting to meet the original Alpha 9 squad. No Romeo, no Dutch, no Mickey, no Rookie, but new, or rather old, faces. And best of all, they are incredibly well written and characterized. And of course, we have Palmer. She is well written, especially for her limited appearance, and the imagery is beautiful. Her holding out against all odds, covered in the blood of her fallen comrades, and doing all she can to survive. It gets me even now. And to top all that off, the battle scenes bleed tension in action, no pun intended. It's like you're there, in the shit with the ODSTs, and you genuinely feel that tension. Moving forward with the story, we jump forward to 2553. Veronica and Buck are on shore leave on a resort planet called Sundown, and enjoying every second of it, if you know what I mean. Hell, they even start talking about a life together, and I mean a real life together. But then, June had to fuck it all up. He comes knocking on their door, literally, saying that he's with the Spartan 4 program, and I can only imagine Buck must feel like people who suffered June's sniping skills in Halo Reach. Jokes aside, June has come to recruit Buck into the Spartan 4 program. What's kind of funny is that June announces he's with the S4 program, but when they let him in, he says he needs to talk to Buck alone, and won't tell Veronica why. Maybe it's just the fact that we as readers have a better perspective, but you'd think that Spartan 4 program would be a pretty powerful hint. Anyway, June and Buck talk, and we get some nice references to New Alexandria and Noble 6 from Halo Reach before June finally pops the question. And as we currently know, Buck turns him down. He is the first, and as we later learn, the only person to turn down the chance to become a Spartan. After June leaves, we flash back yet again, this time to a retelling of Halo 3 ODST. I will say, this brings up the first of a few minor issues I have with this book. This one being that we even have a recap of Halo 3 ODST. While it's interesting and gives us a better perspective of what was going on in Buck's head, it's still a recap in the end. For much of it, while I did enjoy reading it, I was more eager to just get through it and get to the new stuff. While the recap only takes up about 12% or 1 8th of the book, I think it could have stood to be shorter. Still, to the author's credit, he captures the tone of the game extremely well. 
The section then wraps up with a bit about Alpha 9's time with Virgil, Johnson's visit, and their eventual redeployment. This all brings us back to 2554 and Draco 3. Spartan Palmer radios in, offering assistance, but Buck keeps her sidelined. As we've seen in the past, and as established earlier in the book, Spartans and insurrectionists don't mix. He signals Mickey and Dutch to sneak out, circle around, and get Ingridson by surprise. Meanwhile, Buck does his best to buy time the only way he can. He surrenders. He and Romeo come out of cover, weapons down. And as with insurrectionist leaders, Ingridson gives her line about ODSTs and the UNSC being evil, and Buck is, well, Buck. Of course, she makes the big mistake of telling Buck to go home, and Buck responds quite appropriately. I am home. My name's Eddie Buck. I was born right here at Draco Mercy, New Albany, Lombard, Draco 3. Lived most of my life in Karnak before I enlisted to go save humanity. Hell fucking yes. Buck shuts her the fuck up, and boy is it awesome. I get why insurrectionists aren't friendly with the UEG, and both sides have good and bad about them. Still, I'm with Buck in this particular case, and even though I saw it coming a mile away, it was still as awesome as ever when he spit out that line, I am home. And it's still awesome as I'm writing this review. And it gets even better. Buck and Ingridson continue to exchange words. Ingridson accusing the UNFC of starting the war and breaking their promise to protect the colonies, and Buck pointing out how wrong she is. It comes to a head when Buck has finally had enough. To quote again, I blame the filthy racketeer who promises protection and isn't around to supply it when you need it most. And where the hell were you when the Covenant burned this place to glass? Where were you when they sent their soldiers to hunt down my family and friends? Where were you when those unholy bastards ate my sister and her little kids? Fuck yes. And to make things even more epic, just as Buck finishes, he hears that Dutch and Mickey are in position and tells them to go to work. Romeo and Buck make for cover, Buck calling in the Spartans, while Dutch and Mickey blast the door down to the presidential suite. Mickey brings his rifle to bear, orders Ingridson to freeze, and then... Bang! Ingridson blows the rookie's brains out. Reading this for the first time, I actually froze for a few seconds. Mickey shared my sentiment, unable to move after seeing what he saw. Dutch, on the other hand, brings his shotgun up and blasts Ingridson. He hits a second insurrectionist with a second shot, and the third surrenders. The Spartans blast through a minute later, having occupied themselves with insurrectionist forces outside the building. After the mission, it's decided to bury the rookie at sea on Draco 3. The funeral is extremely emotional and conveyed extremely well in the text. In light of what's happened, Dutch has decided to retire, much to everyone's shock, but none more so than Romeo. Dutch and Romeo have a very rich history together prior to Alpha 9, and they have been through a lot. However, with the rookie's death, Dutch is just done. Given that his wife retired a year before, he feels it best. Dutch and Romeo exchange some words, mostly goodbyes. They turn to Mickey, seeing if he wanted to offer any words for the rookie, but he remains quiet, blaming himself for the rookie's death. Dutch says he can't blame himself, but Romeo, in his fashion, says, sure he can, arguing that if Mickey hadn't hesitated, the rookie would still be alive. This goes about as well as one would expect, Mickey taking a swing at Romeo, and Dutch and Buck keeping them from killing each other. So let's talk a moment about the rookie's death. As I said, I actually froze a few seconds when first reading this, and thinking about it again, it still weighs on me. The Rookie was our avatar through Halo 3 ODST, and more so than the Master Chief, as, let's face it, he's always had something of a character, I don't care what people say, the Rookie was literally us. The only other Halo character that could possibly trump that would have been Noble Six, but I'm getting off topic. While it's true that we never really knew anything about the Rookie, it was still shocking to see him killed like this. But to the author's credit, the death of the rookie is handled really well, especially for a character who was essentially a blank slate. We feel for his death, but more so we feel for the squad since they were the ones we got to know throughout ODST, and the ones left behind to be affected. Make no mistake, this is not another instance of Black Team or Team Saber. This is a well-handled death of a character that would only serve to advance the development of others. The only problem I might say I have with it is that we never learned the rookie's name, but that's a minor complaint at best. Things calm down, they put the rookie to rest, and Buck decides to check out his old neighborhood. He eventually comes across a bar that his uncle used to frequent and goes in for a drink. June shows up soon after, offering Buck another chance to say yes to the Spartan 4 program. Unlike before, however, the offer is also being extended to Romeo and Mickey. Given that he'd get to stay with his squad and in light of the events of that day, Buck says yes. The next several pages are all about Buck going through the augmentation process, and it's pretty interesting. We got a good look at the process in Halo Initiation, but New Blood gives us a bit more insight. 
as many had guessed, they do make Spartan 4 candidates taller, extending their bones. Bucky even describes it as something like a second puberty. Beyond that, we mostly hear about stuff we knew, enhanced muscles, unbreakable bones, night vision, etc, etc. While Buck is going through the process, he gives an interesting comparison of the Spartan classes, comparing the twos to the Greek titans, the threes to the gods, and the fours to demigods like Hercules. While I maintain my stance that the average Spartan 3 would stand on par with the average Spartan 2, barring experience and armor of course, I would say these comparisons are a nice nod to the fanbase, more than how the Spartans are actually viewed in-universe. Moving forward, we jump to a Spartan training facility where Buck and his class are being trained to fight like Spartans. Like the Infinity War game simulator, the training grounds use holograms and pneumatic risers to simulate environments. And like Palmer in the first class of 4s, learning to fight like Spartans takes some getting used to. The training is overseen by an Oni captain named O'Day, and boy do I love this woman, a hard ass not afraid to kick a would-be Spartan in the nether region, and not just men. So anyway, we get a little look at the training, and to keep it short, Buck gets beat. Hard. While in the infirmary, a dead Spartan is brought in. The Spartan had been killed during the training session, likely by another Spartan. Earlier in the book, we learned that Oni suspected one of the new Spartans in Buck's class was an any plant, and it seems they were right. Commander Musa and June initially suspect Mickey, a medallion of his found in the dead Spartan's clutches. Of course, it's rarely that closed and shut. Alpha 9 along with the other Spartans are ordered to remain in their quarters while the investigation is underway. A little later, shots ring out in the space station prompting the Spartans into action. Seconds later, an explosion shakes the space station. At the same time, the artificial gravity goes, causing Spartans, soldiers, and objects to fly around. While the situation is quickly resolved, it's not without casualties, notably Captain O'Day. As it turns out, the traitor had been a Spartan named Shine. He'd taken the medallion to frame Mickey and buy time to rig the space station with explosives. Musa and June caught on while checking security footage and found Shine in the rec room, grenades and explosives ready to blow unless they gave in to his demands. June rushed to the traitor while Musa killed the gravity to throw off the switches in the other explosives. Time and time again we see stuff like this happen and honestly, it's good to be reminded that the fours are entirely human. They always have the chance of going traitor on the UNSC. Of course, the good the Spartans can do outweighs this risk. Anyway, this section ends with a bit more about Mickey and Romeo's reluctance to fight humans, and Musa explaining the need for them to fight threats like the United Rebel Front. The next chapter finally brings us back to Talitza. Alpha 9 surrounded by rebels and a gun clinking against Buck's helmet every time he tries to stand up. Buck immediately figures that someone betrayed him, but the question is who? Well, in a brilliant show of how tight-knit Alpha 9 is, Buck figures it out by listening to his squad. Both had told him not to move. But where Romeo called him Gunny, Mickey called him Buck. The team only uses his real name in serious life or death situations. So yeah, Mickey's gone traitor. As it turns out, the leader of the Talitza URF is Dr. Shine, father of the traitor Spartan from earlier, and Shine Jr. had been feeding Mickey URF propaganda for a while. Romeo and Buck are taken prisoner and escorted down the hill towards the URF base. On a side note, before Romeo and Buck were formally arrested, Mickey slammed Buck's face into the ground, cracking his visor. The strange part is that Buck's shields were still working at this point. You could argue that Mickey hit Buck hard enough to break the shield and crack the visor, but the book never says this. Plus, the dialogue throughout states that Buck's shield never dropped. The rest of the book accurately represents Mjolnir's shielding systems, but this scene seems to be the exception. Anyway, on the way down, Dr. Shine starts spouting his any crap about the oppressive nature of the UNSC. Romeo laughs both at the BS Shine is spouting and the fact that Mickey bought into it. Angered, Mickey hits Romeo in the back of the head, causing him to go tumbling down the slope. Most of the URF force is following to recapture him. Taking advantage of the distraction, Buck faces down Mickey, using the traitor's insecurities, especially concerning his parents being traitors, to enrage Mickey further. This gives Buck an opening to disarm the former Spartan and the two start brawling. Meanwhile, Romeo regains his footing and faces down the 40 or so rebels charging him. And I gotta say, I absolutely love what he does next. Grabbing fist-sized rocks, Romeo chucks them at the rebels with full Spartan force. And boy do they hit hard. He brains one rebel, shatters the knee of the other, and basically sends them all running for cover. With freaking rocks! Following that, Romeo picks up a rifle that had been dropped by one of the rebels and opens fire. Back with Mickey and Buck, the two are going at each other with everything they have. It's an awesome fight to envision, and the blows they exchanged are likened to thunder. Eventually, Buck is able to throw Mickey off balance and get on top of him. He then proceeds to slam Mickey's helmet into the ground until his faceplate shatters. Mickey briefly is able to move, flipping himself over to face Buck, but that doesn't really last. Buck straddles the traitor Spartan and continues to smash what remains of his faceplate, finally ending the fight with a headbutt to Mickey's barely protected face. 
Unfortunately, Buck had forgotten about the not-so-good Dr. Shine, who is still armed. With little other choice, Buck surrenders, though not before asking to remove his helmet, fanning a breathing problem. With Buck seemingly a non-threat, Dr. Shine attempts to get Romeo to stand down, Romeo still taking out the remaining URF troops. When Romeo does little more than joke, Dr. Shine's aim wavers, allowing Buck to chuck his helmet at the dock, disarm him, and knock him out. With the immediate threat taken care of and Buck a little short of being okay, Romeo clears the rebel base solo while Buck watches the prisoners. When Romeo finishes, he comes across both Virgil and Sadie, both A-OK. -okay. They call for evac and head to an Oni facility on Mars. Mickey is stripped of his armor and route, and strangely, they don't address the fate of Dr. Shine. Was he left on Talitza or arrested? Or killed? I don't know. Following the debriefing and de-armoring, Buck gets a call from Commander Musa. The two discuss what happened on Talitza and the nature of the Spartan IV program. We get a little insight into why Musa wanted to use average soldiers rather than kids, besides the obvious moral implications. Musa explains that he wanted Spartans that were human, noting that any other Spartan would have killed Mickey on the spot. The book comes to a close with Buck requesting to be a part of a Spartan team rather than a leader, for a while at least, a request Musa grants. And that's Halo New Blood. What a fucking amazing book. A great story from start to finish. We get a great look at the events that forged Buck into the man he is, along with a wonderful follow-up to the events of Halo 3 ODST. The book captures the characters from the game perfectly and does a great job with advancing or bringing to a conclusion each character's story. Buck's journey from Fisher to Marine to ODST to Spartan is fascinating to see, and if I were to say anything negative, it's only that I want more. This book is presented as a story being told by Buck, and it certainly shows. I've said it before, but I'll say it again, the author captured Buck perfectly. Besides that, the book is littered with references to other media and events. Talitza, where the Wetworks Mjolnir variant was tested against the United Rebel Front. Sargasso, where Spartan Daisy 023 was born. We finally get a follow-up with Sadie and Virgil. And we got to see June again. While I'm still not a fan of the fact that June survived the fall of Reach, a bigger disappointment was that they never did anything with him. New Blood fixes that. June's character is absolutely wonderful, and I love the little nods to Halo Reach. Commander Musa is also brought back into the fold. While I have taken issue with his existence in the past, and admittedly I have a bias against anything from Halo Initiation, his character here was well utilized. In fact, unlike Initiation, it was utilized. And then Sarah Palmer. Coming off my big rant from Halo Escalation 15, Palmer's time in New Blood was good, if not brief, actually giving us a look at her past and some of the events that shaped her. But of course, the book isn't without faults, but most of those revolve around personal nitpicks. I would have liked to hear what happened to Mike, for example, the NMPD officer who helped Sadie get out of New Mombasa. I've also seen people say that it can be hard to follow given how often Buck jumps around, but I personally had no trouble keeping up. If I had any serious problems with the book, it would be the United Rebel Front. Initiation introduced us to the New Colonial Alliance, a post-war insurrectionist group, as if to imply that they were the central focus of insurrectionist activity going forward. Granted, the insurrection was never really a unified movement, a point this book brings up in reference to the United Rebel Front's name, but it feels like the NCA should be getting more attention, or they shouldn't have been brought in at all. But still, it's a minor annoyance at best. Overall, Halo New Blood is, I said, fucking awesome, and now one of my all-time favorite Halo novels. Halo New Blood gets a 9 out of 10. Thanks for joining me. This has been Halo Canon, and I'll see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. It means more than I can express in a few minutes of audio. If you did like it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, share it around on whatever social media you see fit, and all that jazz. Thank you so much. Your support is everything. I would not be where I am without you. Thanks.